Hey, welcome back to Make More Music, the podcast that connects people to music and one another. My name is Chris, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. I interview different music and music-related field professionals to dispel the myth that it's just starving artists and rock star, and that there are actually abundant career paths that you can carve out in different uh, ways in the music industry. Today, I get to chat with my colleague and friend, Brian Shrek. Brian should be known to many music therapists if not by his name, by uh, heartbeat recordings. Music cardiography is really the therapeutic process of capturing little bits of humanity through live recordings, whether it is actually a sample or a recording of a heartbeat or laughter or conversations. But Brian will get all into how he developed that and what that looks like now and how that's led to being featured on NPR and developing a documentary Um, but you'll want to stick around all the way to the end because he was gracious enough to share a heartbeat recording. So if you've never heard that, stick around all the way to the end and you'll get to hear an example of that. Without further ado, here is pioneering music therapist, Brian Shrek. All right, Brian, thanks for being here with me, uh, and coming tonight to talk about your story and how you got into music. So, uh, to get in, you're, you know, a music therapy rock star. I love all your work. I, you know, I was super fortunate that, you know, I went to work in Florida and Rich was like, oh, I know him. And I was like, he's from Louisville. No wonder he's so cool. So <laughs> tell me kind of your backstory so I can kind of nerd out and know more about your life. Where, where did you grow up? What, um, and what were some of your first musical memories that of your whole life that you remember? All right, let's dive deep. Let's go all the way down. All right, so I went to, um, I grew up here in Louisville, uh, born and raised till I was 18. So I um, I went to a Catholic grade school called St. Albert the Great, and it was very unique for that school to have uh, a really cool religion teacher that also was interested in having a band. <clears throat> That is so, cool. So, I, I mean, I, I believe it was the only one that had like a full-fledged, basically like a um, before middle school, this like concert band where she would teach us how to play an instrument and then she would handwrite all of the parts out for all of us. Um, if you got to kind of be on her, her inner circle, you got to play at church. Oh. And then... Uh, once the band kind of got more formed and there was about 30 people in it, we were able to go on a mini little tour of all the, the malls, including the Galleria downtown before it was 4th Street Live. Wow. And it, was, it wasn't just that we got to go perform in front of people that were you know doing Christmas shopping or whatever, but we also got half a day off and then we could go out to lunch. And it was just like, great. <laughs> I, I'm in. I was like, I, I'm... I think I, I want to do this forever. So I was in fourth grade playing the saxophone. Um, first solo was good King Wenceslas. Um, Solid. Mall St. Matthews. I'm pretty sure my face was redder than uh, Santa Claus's suit. Um, <laughs> but I remember that feeling of being, being so excited, also by while being so nervous, that I, there's just something about it that I, I think I was just hooked. Um, so I think I knew in fourth grade that that's – that's where I was going. Um, and I kind of went all in, uh, coming into the therapy part of it. Uh, it was later that year, my mom would deliver communion in our neighborhood, uh, nursing home. And she would say, why don't you, you know, you need to practice. I can tell you're bored walking around with me. Uh, why don't you go play in the day room for a while and just practice your, your stuff? So I remember just being this little guy with my saxophone honking out, you know, good King Wenceslas, <laughs> probably, <over> and <laughs> yeah, and, and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I, I saw this one lady look at me like she was just sort of su- surprised that any of this is happening right now. And then another time, this this gentleman stood up, turned off the TV, grabbed a gal that was in a wheelchair, and started dancing with her. And I was like, something's happening right now, and I don't really understand what, but I like it. Yeah, uh, that's pretty amazing. So I think I knew 
at an early age that that I both wanted to be a musician and that there was this extra layer of I don't know if it's just being in different spots of people not expecting you to be there, but got me on my path of of looking towards this not even knowing it at the time of being a music therapist. And then, so from fourth grade on, I, I continued to play throughout high school. I was, you know, in, in the marching band at Ballard High School. I was in mm. the concert symphonic band. Um, I was in the jazz band. Did all county and all states. Um, <clears throat> all saxophone, or you picked up some other things at that point? Or what well, were you doing? saxophone in the band, but around sixth grade, I was very interested in rock and roll. So, uh, uh my older brother gave me his electric guitar and I, I started to sort of noodle around. And then I started to, to pick out little, you know, like come as you are from Nirvana yeah. and then I, the bar chord. And then I would try to, you know, back then in the, you know, the mid nineties MTV had videos and I would try oh, to figure yeah. out a song by the end of the song so I was just very, I was all in. I loved rock and roll. So I started, you know, little indie rock bands and funny little garage bands um, that escalated into, you know, more punk rocky things in high school and hardcore. Um, I was in a band called Canada, uh, <laughs> which is I, that fun. was I, That's what I've been asking people is what are all the funny band names yeah. that you've been a part of? So Canada was my first big band. And then... Uh, I was in another punk rock band called Out with a period. Uh, Love it. And we actually got to go on a few little mini tours up the East Coast and down just playing like really little gross places and amazing places. I was the youngest person in the band. Um, That's super fun. It's kind of amazing that, yeah, I was, uh, and I guess that since I'm the youngest, my my mom was just like, you'll be okay. (laughs) <laughs> um, I've, I've raised this many so far <laughs> yeah yeah um so then uh what else bands i was in a band called hill valley uh the nub tones <laughs> mm. this is getting more into like indie rock and uh i love it i love it so much <laughs> and then in college it was uh all sorts of weird things so i went to berkeley college of music in boston and that just sort of opened up a whole world view on on different people because half the school at that time was from out of the country and it was it was pretty small so your ensembles would have you know five or six people in them and you would get you know if you really like them you started playing with them outside a little bit and then who knows the sky's the limit of how weird you wanted to get um and how deep you wanted to get um but still at that you know in the rock bands and in all of the other bands playing not just the guitar, but bass guitar and drums sometimes. And I still like to do all three of those as much as I can, even locally here in town. That's fun. Yeah. Are you a part of any other bands right now? I know you play quite a bit. Yeah. I've been playing uh, pretty regularly with uh, my friend Joe Manning and some other friends. And that, that group is recently decided on a, uh, I'm still not 100% crazy about it, but it's funny to say it's giant dunes. Um, I think it's more fun to say in an, uh, an Australian accent or something. <laughs> giant dunes. So it's like something giant better. dunes. <laughs> um, it just makes me think of space balls. Like we're going to comb the desert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's And that's exactly what it feels like. So it's a, it's pretty spacey <laughs> folk music. Um that's fun. Part of the, the dunes comes about because in the, the tiny place that we record and spend most of our time playing together, there's a giant bookcase. So half of us can't see the other half of us. So we've gotten used to sort of being just, in this yeah. metaphoric dune in between us that we can kind of explore the space and desert together. There you go. Uh, and then you, you can put all the Dune books up there as well. And then yeah. It gets, even, it gets even more meta from there. Yeah. Dune buggies, whatever you want. Space, <laughs> rocket good. ships. Yeah. Uh, Mars, Saturn, Beetlejuice. Um, so, but some other guys to get, here in town too. Like um, I play with Julia Purcell every now and then, who's also a lovely, wonderful sweet. music therapist. Um, She's amazing. Yeah. A guy named Daniel Lobb that writes really sweet um, 
very aesthetically pleasing, intricate guitar kind of folk stuff. And then my other friend, Daniel Martin Moore, will ask me to do things from time to time. And he's just a, a local gym all around. So, yeah. I love that you're so in the Louisville music scene. That's awesome. I That's not not necessarily the case for I would say probably the average music therapist is not very in their music scene. And I think that makes, that makes a difference on the impact that you make. And uh, it's just really cool. Well, I, I think so too. And I think it's almost necessary. So to me, it fills me back up. It fills my cup back up. I, um, I feel like I get to try things that I think about that I'm, I may not normally do in a therapeutic setting, but I might find something out that is very useful mm. um, in other ways in the therapeutic setting. Um, and then it all kind of blends together. And then you're kind of always on. Like it's never one or the other. I'm not Brian the music or musician or Brian the music therapist. It's just me the whole time now. Yeah, I love that. And that that has been kind of my transformation over the past few years to where it's not this putting on and off a hat. It's just, this is just me and I bring me to where I come. Exactly. Yeah. That's perfect. The, the last thing before we kind of dig into more is I want to know kind of your, your punk rock background. I literally only have one, one tattoo and it is uh, a misfits tattoo. Get out so of here. yeah, it's uh, I've got one thirty eight tattooed on my arm. Uh, Man. And yeah, so I'm, that was like middle school for me. I got a guitar. I started playing Misfits right away. So I want to know, like, who are the big punk bands for you? And then, like, what was that first guitar you were playing? What kind of guitar was that? Oh, Dude. man. So the first guitar was, uh, I've never seen one since then. And my, my brother uh, ended up pawning it, um, which, and I've, I've just always sort of had my eye on it out in the world. But it's a strange old ovation. Uh, that was that kind of looked like a Les Paul, uh, it was 24 frets, one piece, uh, just really weird guitar. That's Funny fun. pickups. Um, so yeah, it was heavy, but also it had a long neck. Um, it played real easy. Yeah, I've never had anything like it since. Oh man, I I a couple of years ago finally decided to 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 sell my first guitar. And I don't regret it, but it was a hard decision <laughs> of the like, am I really going to do this? But I was just like, it's going to make more use to somebody else. I already have my other guitar that I play constantly. So that was a hard selling of that and downsizing. And I've tried to like only keep, only keep, I mean, I have one banjo, one acoustic, one electric. So I'm just trying to pare down Good for to, you. To, to my bare minimum stuff, but you know, the hoarder, the music hoarder in me wants to keep everything forever. So no. it's hard to fight that urge. I'm right there with you. And I've been doing the exact same thing this year. So yeah, I've, I've recently sold a bass clarinet and a tenor saxophone and two guitars. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's so painful, even when you're like, I know I'm never going to touch that. <laughs> like just watching it leave. It's like, no, no I know. But so. hopefully they're in the hands of someone that's doing something wonderful with them now. Let's let's sure hope so. Let's hope well, so. But going back uh, to punk rock. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Go back. All, all all kinds. I love I loved everything. You know, my my brother was eight years older than me, and Black Flag and uh, Suicidal Tendencies and just sort of that late eighties skateboard mm -hmm. trashy. Uh, there's awesome local bands called like Solution Unknown and some other things that were just like, just wild and you know, the mosh and the, um, it wasn't super crazy like that when I was playing, but um, since I was the youngest in the band, the, the singer uh, would take liberty to, to you know, rough house a little bit with me during a show. Mm -hmm. And um, he, would, he would gently, you know, but, but, fervently throw me into the drum set with my bass and um for one show and, and you know this goes against probably all my music therapy uh principles but I, <laughs> I i borrowed one of my friend's kramer basses that has a steel fork top and i was like i'm gonna get him back and in the middle of the show he was about to push me and he started singing again and i hit him as hard as i could 
with the base <laughs> and it's kind of like standing up for the bull you know he like he yeah. had this awesome grin on his face and it was like never again that he yeah, he's like man grown. he did it he, he did, did it, it. Yeah, yeah yeah that's so awesome he's all grown up now <laughs> yeah i can't push him around you anymore know? that's funny yeah yeah hardcore was really big when i was getting into high school and it started i mean it was pretty much done by the time i was getting out of high school yeah but yeah that was humongous when I, and I, I grew up in lexington so there was a a lot of hardcore going on around i was in a bunch of power metal bands in in high school so awesome. i was like way on the iron maiden side of the fence oh man but, awesome yeah well cool so how does um a kid from louisville find out about berkeley and decide he's going to go there and decide about music therapy where did all of that kind of come in I think uh, there was at Ballard, um, a former grad came back to be kind of like our guest conductor one day. And she was telling us all about the cool stuff she was doing at Berkeley and Boston. So it was just kind of implanted early on in my Ballard career of, you know, what is this place? And I would, you know, look it up as much as I could. And, and then um, I, I went on two visits, one to the University of Georgia which was nice. And then uh, my sweet father was like, you know, let's, let's go check out this place you've been talking about for years. Mm. And I was just like, my jaw was, you know, on the floor the whole time we were there. And he was like, I know yeah. you want, I know you want to go to this one. Like I can just tell by the look on your face. And he's like, but I, you know, I just don't, I, I, I don't know if you're going to get in. And it was like, so then it was just like, I'm going to practice and do whatever I can. That's awesome. To get into this place and, you know, do whatever I can to get aid and figure out ways to get around things and be creative. And Yeah, my, my friends who also went to Berkeley said it is really expensive, but they also give a lot of financial support as yeah, well. They're pretty, so. it's pretty amazing all around. Um, and it, it's gotten so much bigger and wilder now. I, I mean, I, I, I haven't been back. I'm going back in February to teach a class uh, for exciting. a day. It's like a CMTE that's offered for regional people. And I'm excited to see how different it looks. I'm also a part of the International Association for Music and Medicine. And mm. Suzanne Hanser is also on the executive board with me. So Berkeley is a big component of this association. And they're hosting this next conference Great. in Boston this summer in May. Awesome. So anybody listening, I think that they should come. That's cool. That's cool. I've never even been to Boston, so that might be my ticket in. Yeah. Uh, so you, you auditioned with saxophone I for did. Berkeley? I did. Awesome. So tell me, you know, when did things start clicking? When were you like, was it? Was it always you were always in on music therapy or was there a, a, a moment that it clicked for you or how did that happen? Uh, I went and talked to the head of the department. So that was Suzanne at the time. But there's also another professor named Karen Wax that uh, that was really sweet to just sit down and talk to me about what what it really was uh, and that I would be doing and studying. And at the time, you know, in the first like year or two there, you know, you're just trying to get your chops down, you know, there's, there's yeah. players that are just like amazing. And, you know, most of the, the really like tremendous performers don't stay the whole time and they move along and get a gig somewhere or go on tour or do whatever that they do. And I never felt that that was in my wheelhouse. Like I just didn't, I didn't believe that I was that good to do that mm -hmm. in that sort of fashion. Um, and in the bands and tours that I've been in, you know, they were low key, they were a lot of hard work, you know, small crowds coming back with not a lot of money in your pocket mm -hmm. and just being like, roughing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not sure if I, that's what I want to do, even though all my people that, that did sort of break through to the other side certainly did that for years and years and years. And going back to that punk rock band out, before the Toy Tiger closed, we were opening up. We didn't know who this person was, but on the marquee it said K I D D R O C K, one word. Oh wow! And we were like, "Who is this guy?" 
<laughs> and we're Bob talking about man <laughs> exactly so we're talking to this guy backstage and he said that you know and there's like eight people there and we're gonna play our you know eight song 20 minute set mm-hmm. and i was like how long have you been doing this this is probably 1997 he was like we've been doing it since 1987 like trying <sighs> like going hard as we can all over the place and it was like 98 or 99 when he had the, that big album. It did. So it, and so yeah. then it was just like, wow. Um, and other friends, like our, our buddies here in town, My Morning Jacket, they were certainly, yeah. you know, they did whatever they could for at least 10 years before they were recognized the way that they are. Um, yeah, that's so, funny. yeah, kind of taking that leap of faith to be like, I'm going to draw my line in the sand and this is who I want to be. And I think it was in that kind of formative years of still trying to figure out my own music that I was like, I love helping people. I love people. I don't want to be sitting in this practice room for, you know, eight hours a day. I need to Mm -hmm. be around people. So if I can use whatever skill I have and what I've, I, I feel like I am to help people, then I feel like, I may find more success in that avenue. Mm-hmm. So then it was just like one day it was like, that's it. Like, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. And I feel like in any career in music, if that decision isn't made, you never really hit it as hard as you could. You kind of always have that one foot in the door, one foot yeah, out. And yeah, and just playing it safe and not, you know... Like, I mean, my first big gig as a music therapist was at Cincinnati Children's Hospital as the first music therapist there. But I lived here in Louisville and I had a pregnant wife and I was like, I I have to have a full time job right now. And I'm willing to drive 105 miles to get there one way. So I did that for two years. And it it was kind of that, that New York. So to rewind a little bit before that happened. Berkeley, I worked, uh, became good friends with one of my professors who got me a job at her job, which is called the Kennedy Day School at okay. Franciscan. Yeah, Florida I've heard Hospital. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Julie Ziggo, uh, I was a teacher's assistant, which was just very hands-on, working with folks uh, that were just a little bit younger than me. Um, you know, I was 20 and 21 and 22 and these people I was basically serving were 17, 18, and 19. Yeah. And they had profound disabilities, um, you know, mostly nonverbal. We had to, to toilet them uh, three times a day. So it was just, you know, really, really elbow deep in humanity. And, mm. um, you know, one of my psychology professors told me, you haven't really lived until you've toileted someone. And, and he's like, not a baby. He's like a person. Yeah, yeah. A, gro- a grown, a grown, yeah, yeah. a very grown person. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that was kind of remarkable. So I, I got to work there a year and a half, and then I got to work in the, another part of that hospital as a mental health specialist with an inpatient, um, kind of long, longish term residential program uh, with eight to eighteen year olds. And I got to bring in any kind of creativity that they were willing to agree to. So I had some wonderful friends that played every night at this place called Wally's. And we did this wonderful, uh, basically just like a, a talent show. And most of these young people weren't allowed to be in the same room all the time together, especially at one time. Wow. And this was the only time all, you know, 15 of them were in the same room, I think because they were so nervous about Mm -hmm. what they had to do. But live band, uh, my roommate at the time is a bass player. He's now in the roots on the Jimmy Fallon show. So his whole crew of just like really boss funk players basically just played whatever song these kids wanted to do. And they sang it while this back live band karaoke. Yeah. Yeah. And it was amazing. So, I mean, just things like that. And then with the, the folks in the day school, we did uh, Grease, and I invited some of my music theater buddies, and we did some wheelchair choreography. So it was just like, I feel like I, I was starting to feel my feels. Yeah. And kind of, you know, but also making money and not being a serious music therapist yet. Like, I was like, I'm saving money to do my internship in New York where I want to go. 
That's awesome. But I, I think that's cool. You, I mean, the way that you practice now has definitely shaped a lot of a different kind of perspective on music therapy. And it's cool to kind of hear how that started budding in that kind of community music therapy aspect and that like, how do we get everybody together? How do we do some unique things? What, what do other people not in this facility do when they go and listen to music or when they do karaoke or, you know, or or how do you be in a musical or, you know? Right. So I think that that it's just so impactful. And I I mean, music therapy is a hundred percent moving that way. And uh, it's cool that that was budding then. So, so you're making a little bit of money. What is, what's the next transitions for you in your story? You know, the next transition is moving from Boston down to Brooklyn, doing my internship and trying to not use more than my student loans were to live in New York. So I was True. eating pizza, which was $1.50 a slice. And could then, be worse. Yeah, it could, <laughs> could be, be worse, way worse than Brooklyn pizza. <laughs> I know. And then I would go down to this little bodega and get sixty cent metal can insurers. And I, I mean, it's crazy. You had all the protein it. you could. Have. That's all I needed. There you go. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so I did that until you know things started looking up a little bit, and then I, um, I met, you know, I, I was in love with. Clive Robbins from the beginning mm-hmm. of learning about music therapy. So I just, I felt like I needed to find him and to be around him. Um, I couldn't afford to do the whole Nordoff Robbins training, but at that time I figured out while talking to the head of the music therapy department at NYU. And the only reason I was even around NYU is because two of the other interns that I was interning with were both masters NYU people. Mm. And Where so did you enter? Beth Israel. I think it's okay. Mount Sinai. But it was with Joanne Lowy and okay. that crew. Um, and it was still pretty small back then. Um, but yeah, the way that she would allow us as interns to do so many cool things together to be like, you know, we're, we're writing this book on end of life care. Um, I want you interns to write a chapter on the music meditations you do in intensive care. And I was just like, what? And it's like, like really? And, and then <laughs> you want us to do that? But then us doing that and then us being like, we're in a, a book now with our other yeah. colleagues. So I feel like there's this feeling of you can do this. And if you're surrounded by people that believe in you, they give you these wonderful opportunities to do things that you may not normally get to do if you weren't at that place at that time. Yeah. And to me, New York very much felt like that. So at that same time, I realized that since I was already board certified after I finished the internship, I could do a one year kind of advanced masters at NYU and take a class with Clive the entire time. Oh man, that worked out. Awesome. So I got to spend, you know, three hours a week with just Clive with five other students and just, you know, soak in whatever he was talking about. And I think that's where a lot of the recording comes in. So they recorded everything and it became just a part of their practice. And as soon as I got in to the clinical setting, I had my laptop and I just started recording. And so you went from there. Was was there anything in that transition before Cincinnati Children's? Um, let's see here. Not too much. Um, maybe a few months of moving from New York to Louisville just because we wanted to be closer to family because we were pregnant. Yeah. So uh, no contracts or anything during that time? Uh, I believe, yeah, Jenny Branson got me a contract at Westport Middle School uh, that was once a week. And then I did one piano lesson for a special needs young lady. Uh, but yeah, I was starting to freak out. And I think that's like yeah. in that time where you're like, oh my God, I can't find a good gig that I need to cast my net a little bit bigger. And and that's... With a baby on the way too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, I mean, from where I lived in Brooklyn to where I was work, ended up working in Manhattan at St. Vincent's um, Catholic Medical Hospital, just in palliative care with adults 
that had everything under the sun, half of them cancer, most of them end stage AIDS, but everything else in between. And there's nothing like a New York sort of education and life of someone, you know, telling you really what they thought about you to thicken your skin <laughs> and be like, how old are you? And be like, get out of here. You can't tell me anything right now. You don't know anything about anything. Oh man. And then that- I don't know about you, but that's literally like why I grew a beard in like senior <laughs> year of college. And then it's just stuck. Yeah. Clients still find out how old I am. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sneaky with the beard. <laughs> I know. I know. It's tough. So adults, adults, yeah, would, would really give it to me in a, an amazing way that really thickened my skin. And then that commute was about 80 minutes from where I worked on the subway back to my house. Mm-hmm. So when I was in Louisville, I was like, I can handle driving 100 miles. You know, it's basically yeah. the same amount of time as I was going to work anyway. And I think it was that also that, that kind of New York attitude of being like, you you have to commute no matter what and yeah you're tough yeah yeah and like, you can do it you don't complain you about that yeah, yeah 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 that's funny so um you're working at at Cincinnati Children's and you you're taking a lot of recordings is that mostly like songwritings or what kind of projects are you are doing at that time and then how did that evolve into what would become the heartbeat recordings i mean all over the map i would record them laughing i would record some of them telling stories uh it was always for a reason some of it was to make a a recording for their bigger brother or sister or their little brother or sister at home but i mean most of it was in the the main sort of philosophy of just staying connected um Mm -hmm. and it was before people were facetiming and could do all the wonderful yeah. things. So you were quite literally that like literally. FaceTime yeah. We were connections. Yeah. yeah. Transmitting one way things, you know, possibly to California, to Saudi Arabia, to, I mean, all over mm. the place. Um, yeah. So it was a way to feel connected and share whatever thoughts that they felt like doing at that moment. Yeah. Some of it were songs and some of them were them singing on top of songs and us just messing around, but just building a reservoir of whatever whatever life sounded like to them that that is pretty amazing to think about so you've kind of told i've heard you tell this story about the diego stocco yeah but when did when did that all kind of hit you and for the people who don't know give a little bit of background of like how that came into your life sure um so a, a lot of the recordings i was doing were when people were you know either in a transition or in a part of their long chronic illness to where I was catching really wonderful moments. Mm -hmm. And, and then as the world progressed at Cincinnati children's and we could hire some more people, I got more specific into being for three years, just in intensive care. So a Mm -hmm. lot of these people were all, all sorts of accidents, all sorts of chronic illnesses, all sorts of just worse things in the world. Uh, but a lot of them were sedated and intubated. Mm -hmm. So, in that space, there wasn't anything good that you wanted to remember. You, I, it, it didn't feel right to record anything because yeah, who would want to come revisit this time? Beeps um, and yeah, uh, nurses coming in and turning on a light and dressing changes and all that sort of stuff. Family members crying and yeah, yeah. Unless it was to you know capture them saying something that they could or. Or whatever, but yeah, it was in that sort of like desert of not recording that I wasn't used to, and seeing all sorts of things about you know just the the heart you know and the cardiac intensive care units like in everyone's faces and monitor mm. and you're always looking at the heart rate and transplants and artificial hearts and I mean so it was just like running around in my conscious and subconscious. Mm. Um, seeing uh the diego stocco um uh, i think it's music from a tree where he has all these sorts of microphones rigged up to capture all these different sounds you can make from a tree and layering them into this beautiful sound collage that a patient showed me uh while i was doing uh home hospice and it, that brought about a beautiful idea of recording all the sounds of his life in his room 
um, all of his equipment, all of the things that were the sounds of his life. And then, but he, he could still talk. He could still, you know, there's still so many wonderful things we could capture for him. But going back to the intensive care unit, it was uh, this video I saw by uh, a lady named Tara Storch. I think it was on Good Morning America with Robin Roberts. Mm -hmm. And it, it basically shows the story of uh, a teenager going on a skiing trip with her family on a vacation, getting a, a horrific accident, uh, donating her organs before she died. And then, you know, a year or two later, the mom finding the recipient of that heart. And that lady was a nurse. And as soon as they met up, the nurse who had her kid's heart in put the stethoscope in the mom's ear. And it, as soon as she heard that sound, it was like a light bulb. And I knew that there was other people, you know, one of my favorite music therapists, Catherine Yeager, I think it's Catherine Bruno now. She did her internship with Deforia. And mm -hmm. there was someone either at that hospital or at the Cleveland Clinic doing um, pre and postpartum, like high risk pregnancies, multiple loss, uh, bonding. So they, mm -hmm. they would record like ultrasounds and then they would just sort of put that in the background of a lullaby or something that they create, would create with the mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of, you know, rolling around in my brain as well. And then there's this jazz drummer named uh, oh, Milford Graves, I think is his name. And he studies the heart just so that he can play better jazz and he can feel his internal rhythm so that he can execute better his external rhythms. Mm. So all this was floating around in my mind. And um, it was like, let's, let's just try to figure out a way to record these people's heartbeats and use it as a foundation of whatever. And I don't know mm. what it will be. Um, to me, it became very real and very powerful and profound when I was working in perinatal hospice, which is working with women that were expecting a baby that was not expected to survive. So it had something catastrophic wrong with it. And some of those sounds that we got in the OB appointments were the only sounds of life that we got. Um, mm -hmm. So using that as a way to connect and bond um, and share with and work with their immediate family really got my wheels turning with different ways that we could start to use the heartbeat in all sorts of ways. Um, getting the whole family involved, um, getting their pets involved. Uh, there was a hospice visit where they, they were going to not only lose someone in their family, but they found out that their dog was super sick and they were going to have to put it mm. down at some point mm. soon. And it was the, the dad's dog and he'd had it since before they were married and so we, that's a part of the family and we brought yeah. it into the mix. And um, I really think that it helps in this post, well, in the pre-loss work, like with anticipatory grief, but I think it can really, like since we're kind of hitting it so hard on that end, by the time that the worst thing happens, we can continue to use that sound as a thread that I really think can impact bereavement in a positive way. yeah yeah absolutely it's uh it's been amazing all the different situations that uh after i chatted with you and exchanged some emails with you and figured out okay how do i make this work man the opportunities it's just like you it's it's just exactly like your story you keep your eyes open your ears open and you everyone's know, different and it can everyone's be different. Yeah. People just walk situations just come to you. And I think like you were saying, some of the most meaningful ones that I had, um, were not even bereavement. I, one that was really interesting was, um, in the NICU, I had a family that was adopting one of the NICU babies and it was coming from Germany and because of a, you know, military, uh, family kind of thing. So U.S. citizen, cool. often a international military base. We did a heartbeat recording 
because her husband um, couldn't get leave like that fast to come. So we surprised the husband with this recording. Oh, of man. Hunter Hayes uh, want to make you feel wanted. It was uh, the what they wanted the baby to feel. They wanted to make them feel wanted. And I was like, oh, it literally like rips me open every time I think <laughs> about that. But I think it's like you're saying, the whole continuum, it's amazing to see how it helps with bereavement, how it helps uh, a cardiac patient, you know, after a transplant, what does my heart sound like now or totally symbolizing that strength. And so t- tell me a little bit now you've, you had your eyes open and this kind of just stumbled on a bunch of different things coming together for you. What has all of this meant as far as uh, your work, as far as I know you've received a ton of press about this. So what has this all evolved into in the way you practice now? Well, with adults, it's, it's always um, quite a different scene than it, it is in the peds world. So there's a lot more, just a lot more uh, depth that can happen just with the way that they're experiencing their experience. So they can mm-hmm. verbalize a lot more. So I do whatever I can to get them as involved as possible in these recordings. And that's why I try to do them as early as possible. I don't, we're still always going to fight against that, you know, 11th hour um, mm-hmm. sort of medical personnel that is um, really wanting to offer something that. Some, Tangible in that last minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, that still can be wonderful, uh, but it's, it's. I'm doing a little bit of a retrospective just sort of program evaluation on the 240 that I've done since I've been here in Louisville with adults. Wow. And I'm asking uh, just really three basic questions, which is, uh, do you still have the recording? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you listen to it? If so, how often? And then what do you think about if you answered yes to any of those when you listen to it? And it's wow. all over the map. And I think a lot of it is still like, you know, in, in my recounting of the actual stuff that we were doing and the timing that we did it, the ones that we did earlier and spent more time on in the relationship and all of that, but it, it appears to be a lot more accessible to these families. Hmm. The ones that we did it very quickly without much relationship Um, some of them, you know, and I've just been doing this the last, like the last part of the week and today. Um, Mm -hmm. so I made 50 calls on Thursday and 50 today. Wow. And it's all over the map and a lot of them had lost it or misplaced it or forgot that they had it. Um, Mm -hmm. and those are the ones that I met kind of quickly. Um, which also kind of just leads me to believe that as nice and as important a lot of the work a music therapist can do without that therapeutic relationship Mm. it can all kind of get washed lost in the wash and not that not to be uh cynical but i mean there is also that return on the investment of they're not they're not like the world's easiest thing to do and when i was first learning it took me a long time to figure out how to do that process some of those recordings took like way longer than I think they, they probably should have. So I think there's that element too. It's not like the same as visiting a patient and documenting right after in that 40 minutes. Exactly. You know? So I think in that insight, that's becoming more and more evident to me, if I haven't done music therapy with them and they don't know about the music component of this and I don't plan on, or they don't know, and there's no plan to work in bereavement together. I think it is, it's just as fine just to offer the heartbeat. Yeah, we started town. doing that before I moved from Orlando as well. And I think it just makes sense across the board in so many, this, you know, in our professional time, you know, responsibility. But also, I'm also founding and, and finding and calling these people that some of the ones that got the heartbeat only listen to it just as much as they do mm-hmm. the other parts. So to me, there's something about that sound that can't possibly bring just as much whatever 
that they're looking for. Mm. As all the artistic endeavor you can then put on it. Yeah. Which is still kind of reflecting back on, is this about me or is this them? Like, am I doing all of this? Like, of course you want it to sound aesthetically wonderful as possible. But if it is out of the wheelhouse of like, you know, I've, I've talked to a music therapist out in California that was saying, you know, I don't sing like Stevie Wonder, so I, I would feel silly singing like Stevie Wonder, and they don't want to sing on the recording. So then let's just sample one beat and then put it under real Stevie. Mm-hmm. And once yeah. you can show a family how to do that, they could then add it wherever so they want to put it on. Yeah. And then that's that's the intervention then right there. It's not the yeah. other thing that we have in our mind that is supposed to live on a shelf or be played at their funeral or and all those things yeah. are awesome and are possible, but I think it, it still needs to come back to that individualized yeah. care and what one person needs isn't what everyone needs. True. Yeah, and we can't be the gatekeeper of literally the sound of their heartbeat. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh well that that is really awesome, man. So you're doing this study and you also, uh, is, th- is there already a documentary or is it still in development or what is the beat of the heart? I've only seen the trailer. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's still in process. Um, okay. we've taken a little bit of a pause just to sort of gather some thoughts. Um, th- there's some, there's a lot of stuff we have and a lot of people that we've covered in this process. Um, and it's, it's, difficult with money and time to make it into a long piece so a lot of the film festivals and things um they appreciate smaller cuts okay so they take more so it's it's kind of in a smaller like 25 minute piece right now that is being submitted to some of the like south by southwest and awesome little film festivals around. So if one of those happen, then I think it could turn into something a lot cooler. It is, so it is it, already cool, but yeah, it's in kind of a middle phase right now. It is. And cool. it, when we started this, there was kind of an unknown kind of lens of, we don't know exactly where this is going. And it, even <laughs> in the two years that we've been filming it, it's still, evolving even in the way that I think about it. So yeah, I hope from start to finish, it will look a lot different at the end. That that's really cool. Well, uh, and going back to that kind of Clive Robbins and and Nordoff um, approach of recording everything, you know, it's, it's, it's assessing the needs and evolving as we are and they are. So to me, it makes sense. And yeah, for you, it's it. your life. You're like, yeah, yeah, it'll be. It, it is what it is, and it'll be what it'll be. <laughs> exactly, and I'm not going to stress out about it in the meantime. Yeah, that's cool. But I want uh, people to see kind of from um, an inside-the-room lens, which is hard to get. You know, it's just as hard to re- to video record in a hospital as it is to do, you know, a lot of crazy recording. Um, so just even getting a patient that's in the right state of mind and mood doesn't mind the way that they look, um, you know, all those things that that are important to people. If there wasn't a therapeutic rationale for them being in it and they didn't feel good while doing it, then we didn't do it. So that yeah, all, they're not they're not actors and yeah. actors, actresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just kind of have to go with that undetermined flow as well that, you know, you might have every the lights, camera, ready action, and they're like, nope. It's like, okay, yeah, all right. All good. Yeah. That's cool, man. Well, where are uh, things developing for you right now? Like what is what is the next kind of phase of, of, of your career and the things that are going on for you right now? I think this year, early this year, I've, I've done a lot of these. I've done, you know, over 200 of these recordings with adult patients. And some of them, my favorite ones were ones where they did kind of give me free creativity to play whatever I wanted. And a lot of it was similar in my recounting of our time together. So stuff that I would play in the room, things that were 
you know, going on in, in that time of year. Um, but it got me feeling creative in a way as a real musician again, um, which is also kind of why I like a part of this intervention that I still get to kind of play on my own while connecting with these people. Yeah. So I'm going to ask their permission if I can just do like a short release of like five or six of them, either with or without the heartbeats mm. in the back of just, just another layer to show the world that this is what some of it can sound like. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So I, I'm, I'm excited to do that. And also just to feel like, you know, kind of just making my stance of this is, this is what I sound like too. Yeah. I think that's cool. And I think that what you hit on too is really interesting is I think that there can be that barrier sometimes in, in therapy, but I think you've done another interesting thing and walked right into, this is me in a musical reflection and a musical validation and a musical summation. It's basically a, you know, the same way you would have verbal techniques and counseling. You're basically literally doing all of that through music. Exactly. I think that's pretty, pretty amazing. And you know, for a lot of people, how validating is that? Like, not only did this person understand what I was going through, he understood it on this artistic level, <laughs> you know, like that's, and that's what like, I hope that that was my only hope. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, so and, and going back to your point of like the, the impact that these people have on you as a person. And if I mm -hmm. can, feel like I'm giving anything back to them as a thank you for all the things that they've taught me and capture a little bit of a piece of what it felt like to me in this art form. Yeah. I'm, I want to share it too. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I agree with you. What a, what a blessing of a job that sometimes it's like, man, I get, I get paid to do this. Like, it's like, this is awesome. And I'm going to try and give back to them because I feel like, Sometimes I'm getting, even though I know that I'm helping at the same time. So kind of to wrap up then, we know we've spent quite a while. Um, you've already talked a lot about, you know, how and your kind of whole mission of connecting with people. The whole point of this kind, uh, podcast is to connect people to music and one another. So not only how, but why do you inspire others to make more music? Why are you capturing all of these sounds, these heartbeats? Why flesh out that philosophical piece for us? Well, I think even just thinking about just the heartbeat in itself, it is, it is a symbol of love. It's a symbol of connectedness. Um, it's a rhythm that's in all of us. To me, it is... Um, to me, it's been the only like thing I've been holding on to to feel like we all are connected um, in mm. some capacity. And I like to learn from every patient that I'm working with. Uh, that could certainly be me. So when I'm when I get cancer, or when I'm in the hospital, these are things that I can look for. Things that I can I can learn from you from watching you go through yeah. all of this um i think if i can spark any of that in them it makes everything make sense to me in a world that is completely abstract even with these abstract sort of things i'm placing on them i feel like they can yeah. somehow bring it together in a way that feels right um one of my favorite things I did last year was to try to assemble a crew of musicians from around Louisville, all sorts of genres, uh, from singer songwriters to R&B artists to hip hop. And we created this thing basically for the hospital. Mm. Uh, my morning jacket let us use one of their tracks to remix and we used their chorus, which is called the victory dance, which, yeah which the, the whole thought behind that was we're going to celebrate today. You know, the hard work that we accomplished today. We're not looking down the road tomorrow or even next week. We're going to mm -hmm. focus just right now on all the awesome stuff that you did today. And that deserves to be celebrated and bringing, you know, Chikori, 
Arthur and mm. some other folks that didn't know each other and it came together so easily with them in a way that felt not just like we are the world, but it felt like <laughs> this can happen even in this town that still has a lot of things going on. Uh, yeah, with, absolutely. With not all of us coming together in a lot of ways, uh, even in the music community, even in the arts in general. So I think I, I really did my best to try to find those kinds of open-minded people that were not just interested in coming together, but hopefully with the thought that they would then continue to work together in some. Mm -hmm. So if you needed someone like them on a track, you know them now. Yeah. So it was, that's amazing. It was blending it all together and it made me feel proud as an organizer, less as a performer, just to be like, this is possible. So I think once you know that things are possible, it's kind of going back to the, if you only do some things, only some things get done. If you do everything, everything gets done. And I just That's try to awesome. hit it like that in the face every day. Yeah. And do your own little victory dance. I love it. I'm doing it right now with you. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I've loved hearing all of these stories and hearing your backstory a little bit. Uh, so we're going to transition. Actually, these are just going to be like some quick six rapid fire questions. Okay. So, um, you don't have to have quick answers to them, but they're just short. They're just short questions. Um, whatever it is, whether it's your phone or your computer or whatever, pull open your, your music player, Spotify, Apple, or whatever, and just tell us the last song you listened to. Oh, wow. Okay. I got it. Uh, I need to look up the exact, how to pronounce it. Uh, it's an artist named Rosalia. Hmm. And she's a total awesome lady. This song is called Pienso en tu mira. I I feel like I've heard some music from her. I don't know. She's a Spanish artist. She's young, but and she really marries uh flamenco with, you know, hip hop and uh, lots of different she's That's starting to be guest artist on people in America. Mm. So she's really I feel dark. like I heard her in Orlando. Yeah, I, I bet feel you like did. There were some teens in Orlando that were about her. But check out the I mean the music video is crazy. It's really about like I love you so much like my heart hurts. Mm. Uh another one, do you need another one? Uh you can is give that... us more. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Sure. Um Smog. Uh Mother of the World. There it is. Uh, and, all right, next one. Okay. Or yeah, yeah. Give me your next one, and then we'll go for the next question. Uh, I find myself watching quite a lot uh, Anderson Pox Tiny Desk concert for the last couple of years, and then if I really need some really lovely, um, this like full band hip hop, Kendrick Lamar on Jimmy Fallon just, I mean, still gets me excited, mm. and it's it's years old now. That's good. Have you watched that uh, the Wu Tang Clan series yet? I haven't. Man, I I haven't either. There, that was the craziest concert I've ever been to. It was at Expo Five here in town. Holy cow! My ear still has a ringing that happened at that concert. Good for you. Uh, yeah. So there, I think it's on it's on uh, Amazon Prime or Hulu or something. There's a whole series about the history of Wu Tang Clan. Oh man. Uh, so I, I'll I'll look that up after we're done and I'll send it to you. Awesome. Um, so if you were an instrument, what would you be? Ooh. It can be as philosophical as you want to be or as just like, this is what I want. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go with the kick drum. Kick. All right, why kick drum? Uh, I think it can, it can serve as so many different kinds of parts of uh, a rhythm. Mm. But holding The it, heartbeat of the song. Yeah, holding it together, but also, you know, it can be fast. You can can be more jazzy. It can be, uh, can have a tone. It doesn't have to be just a thud. Um, nice. I'm always still very interested in like, uh, even like intricate, um, progressive metal still with like all of the crazy rhythms and double bass kick things that oh. people can do. It's wild. It's wild. I used to mess around with the double bass pedal a lot in high school. So, <laughs> just like go, you're just legs. If you want a leg workout, that's a leg workout. 
I know, but there's yeah. so many cool tricks that you can do now that it doesn't look like they're working that hard. Yeah, true, true. Uh, what's one thing that's been inspiring you recently? Hmm. Wow. I mean, it's certainly not the news. <laughs> um, it's never the news. My kids uh, play basketball, and they're both... Um, you know, there's an A, B, and C team, and they're both on the, their C teams, eighth grade and sixth grade. And uh, I love when they're hustling, and, you know, my wife and I are not sport people, um, but they've both had moments in, in their games this year that get my heart racing, and That's I, awesome. I find myself yelling things I would have never <laughs> yelled, like, oh, my <laughs> God, and just, like, you know, like, you're so good <laughs> you know? you're like i'm sporting right now I'm, yeah i'm getting my sport on which is unusual <laughs> um and then and then with my wife we're trying to uh to do some workouts uh together so that's feeling connected not just uh with each other but feeling um like we're trying to make our bodies feel a little bit more more in there shape, you go. uh a little more alive instead of uh yeah, just always filling them up. Trucking, trucking, trucking along. along yeah. And then passing yeah. out at the end of the day. So yeah, <laughs> True, make, I understand that. Yeah, so taking some time to, to fill up our own part part in this world. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, this could be as simple as something you're doing at work or something you do in your life. Uh, what's a pro tip or a hack that you practice that you feel like people should know about? Wow. Uh, drink, drink your coffee in the shower. Oh, why so? I mean, you can just, you don't have to have one or the other. You can just do both at the same time. <laughs> That's the adult version of shower beers. <laughs> it is. And then you can have your toothbrush in the shower too and do that right after you're done. I do. Coffee. My toothbrush is frequently in the shower. Like it's not always in there, but it usually is. Um, and I think it's, it's always good to have a nice podcast ready on your cell phone for when you get back in your car and not even turn on the, the news or the radio. Yeah. Uh, Learn something. Literally, like I said, never the news. Never the news. Uh, yeah. One thing that struck me is like, oh, I've turned. I, I'm, I'm an adult now. <laughs> I, uh, we were getting ready to go out one night and, you know, normally college me was like, oh, we... I need a pregame before I go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now I realize I'm like, oh, I typically reach for a cup of coffee before I go somewhere. So I was like, that that's when I turned. Yep. It's, it's when I pregame with coffee. It's happened. Yeah. Uh, well, this will be a good transition from your new healthy lifestyle. Uh, what is your go-to junk food? Oh, man. Um, I mean, I love, I love any kind of sweets. So my wife... She works at a, a place that they, they have free lunch and desserts, and she brings me home uh, either an oatmeal cream pie or some sort of Little Debbie mm, almost that's every love. day. Almost every day. <laughs> sometimes I'll love. hold off and I'll wait until, you know, I'll put it in my car, or sometimes my, my kids will find it and eat it before I do. But, mm. but yeah, a nice oatmeal cream pie that's, you know, been – been beat up in a purse or <laughs> all crumbly yeah kind of warm well, <laughs> that natural warmth that's my go-to <laughs> that's good that's good <laughs> uh, what is a person uh project or organization you'd want to lift up with a shout out oh i think this international association for music and medicine it's people Sweet. from all over the world um it's kind of like hogwarts you know there's nerds like us everywhere and we're all the same no matter what, awesome. what language we're speaking um we can still connect and share all the amazing research that's going on all over the world i think that's the next t-shirt for them kind of like hogwarts yeah <laughs> there you go uh that's cool and the the conference is in boston at berkeley uh -huh. in may and early that's may awesome. i think it's may 6th all right, and this uh, is look, it's not going to be in America probably anytime soon because it's it's every other year this happens, and I've been in the association for a few. It was in Canada, and then uh, let's see, it was in 
Toronto, and then it was in Beijing, and then it was in Barcelona, mm. and now it's in Boston. And I, I guarantee it will be somewhere even more incredible outside of the U.S. the next time wow. around. Awesome. Get it while you can, while it's close. Get huh? it. That's exciting, man. Well, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, where where can people find your work or, you know, where when someone's surfing on the Internet and they want to learn more about Heartbeat Recordings and, you know, what you do and all that, where would you send them to? I think some of my favorite uh, media pieces, one has been on All Things Considered. Um, you can just type in Brian Shrek Music Therapy or Brian Shrek Heartbeat. Um, mm hmm and then there's another one uh, that we did at Cincinnati Children's that um, just kind of shows the beginning of the work. Awesome. And then, of course, I would say your Beat of the Heart trailer. If somebody hasn't seen all of this, that might be what I recommend before they even cool. listen to you talk about this. But uh, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to sign off. And just everybody remember, give more grace, share more love, and make more music. Like I said, this episode's going to end just a little bit differently. I have an awesome heartbeat recording here, a music cardiography snapshot that Brian was gracious to share. So stick around, listen to that. If you have any comments or concerns or reactions, you can email me at makemoremusicpodcast at gmail.com. You can leave us a rating or review. And please join the Instagram community at make.more.music. All right, check this out. I love you.